Hey, looks like we're live. Sweet. Awesome. So, let's uh, take a couple of minutes and make sure everybody can see everything that I'm trying to show off. Um, if you guys have been paying attention to the updates, the object in front of you, you would probably recognize as the realized concept art from the amazing Rob Waters. Uh, this is an iris store. If anybody has played System Shock 1, this is one of the most iconic doors in the entire game. And by the way, I'm Jonathan. I am one of the environment artists who's just recently got picked up to work on this. And I'm really happy to be here and show off and see how you guys think of, or what you guys think of what we're working on. Uh, I know there's so much excitement around this game. This has been such a huge part of my life. Uh, it's kind of like a dream come true to actually get to work on it. So, yeah, I mean, if everything looks good and you guys don't see anything wrong, let me know and we'll get this thing started. I'll show you how I do my job. So, I guess, in other words, welcome to How It's Made System Shock Edition. <laughs> it's glad to have, I'm sure everyone's glad to have you here and streaming because I think we need more and more dev streams. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, some of you may know me from the other community that actually, you know, I do Carly's job over there. I'm the <laughs> community manager for uh, Pixel AV, which is a massive uh, texturing company based out of Sweden. Uh, we, we do a lot of awesome stuff. It's not really about them, so I'm not going to talk too much about them. But uh, you might know us as the people who helped MPC visualize the Jungle Book, with the uh, foliage and everything else you see in that movie is basically done with the Megascan service, which is one of our texturing solutions we provide. And we're actually collaborating with Night Dive Studios to bring mega scans into System Shock. So those of you who really want to see the groves come to life, I think you're going to see it. It's going to be something cool. Collab. So, um, as you guys know, this is the Iris store. Um, honestly, this thing perplexed me quite a bit. I had no idea how it was going to come together until I, you know, sat down with Rob and we kind of hashed out how it actually functions and moves. And yeah. Um, I have this thing animated and rigged, so currently you can actually open it up. Uh, it does everything Rob wants it to do, which, as far as I'm concerned, this is Rob's project. He's the guy that basically set the entire visual standards of the original system shot, uh, and he's been brought back to help me master it. So I just do whatever Rob says. So if Rob says, jump, I jump, regardless of how high he wants me to jump. And Rob said he wants this thing to spin and do certain things, and that's what I need to do. Uh, no, Rob is not in, in charge of everything. And maybe I sound kind of weird. Let me check my mic settings. I'm really sorry about that, guys. Yeah, it might be a little bit... Um, maybe if you have a headset on? I don't know. I have what my, will sound best? I have my microphone attached to my, uh, my shirt. That should be oh, I see that now. But I'm not sure why it's not. It actually might be using my webcam. So let me just double check. Oh, yeah, you might want to check the sound. But welcome everyone. <laughs> Everyone's starting to tune in. Okay, let's try that. Does that sound any better? At least I would hope that it would. It does. Let me hear. Oh yeah, they're saying better. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, it, <laughs> it's never a live stream for me unless something weird goes to the other. <laughs> so it's good to see. Well, this is your me. first one too, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, for those of, up. those of you guys who don't know, we did recently switch to Unreal Engine, and yeah, that's that's them, those are my guys. I, I love the Epic guys very very much. Uh, having had the privilege to meet up with them and and uh, you know BS with them at GDC was quite the quite an amazing experience. And getting to wear this sweet shirt is all the much better, especially since you know with all the recent switch and whatnot, it's it's good to show solidarity. So. What I'm going to pretty much do today is I'm going to show you guys how one of these assets is uh, pretty much brought from modeling to texturing. And texturing is one of the most important aspects of any game's development, uh, especially with what we do. Uh, the art style that we create for the, or have created for this particular game, you'll notice it's very pixelated looking. Um, we kind of want to keep that retro style from uh, kind of like that. that I, I like to call it Minecraft in HD, where it's more like... You see the pixels, but they're not too terribly noticeable until you get close to it. 
So for example, if you zoom into this door, you'll see that it's made of you know, pixels. Well, everything in, in 2D is made of pixels, right? That's just how it works. This is all done because we're not filtering the textures. So it's not being interpolated. I don't normally explain these things, so I'm, I may have a bit of a brain fart trying to talk about it. Um, but so what we pretty much do is we, we build everything to be pixel perfect and we disable all of the filtering so it becomes naturally much sharper. So you get this particular look instead of this look, which to me looks, it looks good, but it's not the style that we're going for. So essentially what I have here is a door that's been modeled, it's been animated, it's had its UV layout pretty much created so that I can apply textures to it. I use, for the vast majority of my work, I use a tool called Quixel Suite. And it is the company that I work for that produces the tool who also happens to be, like, I'm the guy that also develops the tool. I'm the guy that show runs the development of it. So it's kind of a neat little position to be in where I'm kind of directing into the development of the tool that I use on a daily basis. Uh, and for this, essentially, like, you can't see the tool on my screen because I tried to actually get OBS to display it, but because it's hardware uh, accelerated, it shows up as a black box. So I'm, I apologize in advance that I can't actually show that to you. But what I can show you is the end result. And one of the first things I'm going to do is show you the steps to actually build this thing up piece by piece, which involves, number one, making this thing look like it's supposed to. And if you go and look at Rob's concept art, you can clearly see this is kind of a stainless steel door. Uh, it's got a lot of different, you know, scratches and imperfections, a little bit of details all over it. It's a very unique looking piece of equipment. Um, in the original game, you only found it in a handful of positions. Um, the, the most notable would be the flight bay where the escape pods are, which is this particular door. And you can see that we've pretty much kept the entire aesthetic to it. It's still the same door. It just has a couple of small differences where the, I feel like it's more visually unique in the sense that it doesn't have just random greebles attached to it anymore. And it does have a bit more of a, a realistic look to it now rather than what it was before where it looked kind of flat. So as I said, we're going to start texturing this by actually applying a material to it. And I have a custom made material that I built myself using uh, Quixel's Megascans data, which I have actually built to be very close to an actual material in real life called cold rolled steel. And I spent the better part of a day studying the different properties of this particular uh, metal to try to get it to look as accurate as possible. So what I'm going to do is apply that, export it out to the viewer, and then you guys can actually see it in real time. So give me one second and let's put that on there. And like I said, I, I'm, I'm sorry I can't actually show you the process behind me selecting the materials that I've made and, and display them because OBS doesn't really play well with hardware accelerated stuff. So you'll see the end result in just a moment. But this is already so informative. <laughs> I, I tend to ramble, so if I talk too much, to, don't hesitate to tell me to knock it off. <laughs> <laughs> So the first material that came through is, again, this is my own custom material. This is uh, anything you can really find in the hardware store, uh, which is what I kind of got my inspiration from. Um, this is literally just a very common material. It's a form of steel that's developed using a cold rather than hot process. Um, this looks very contrasty and dark because of the environment it's put in. So let's go ahead and change the sky so it's not a nighttime uh, skylit environment, more like a a garage would probably be closer to the space station. So you can already see it's significantly less dark and it looks more like you know what you would expect steel to look like. So this again because of the unfiltered nature of the textures it's very sharp. Very very sharp. No matter what I do to it it's always going to have an element of, of sharpness to it that really makes it pop and stand out. And I personally love this look. I think it's probably one of the best art styles I've seen in a recent game. So I'm glad that we've kind of gone with this particular uh, visual style over alternative ones. I'm trying to find ways to <laughs> say what I think without saying the wrong thing. Um, so yeah, this is going to be the base material that's pretty much going to define most of what this mod is going to look like. Um, again, because Rob has a very specific vision, it's my job and I'm entrusted with the duty of bringing that vision to life as best as I can. So. You can see that like this thing fully functions. It's got everything it needs so far to actually do what it needs to do, but the only thing it's missing is the additional textures that I'm adding. So the next step to actually getting this thing to look like what we want is to, again, study the model itself, or rather the uh, the concept a bit more. So on my third monitor, like, which is why you see my head kind of popping around, uh, I'm looking over here at the, uh, the closed side of this door. 
when this thing spins at the very top, it has red lights. Now, I can't animate that particular part, which is going to have to be done in Unreal Engine itself. Um, what I can do is actually add the lights so that they do throw light out at the player. And I can add the paint, subtle wear and tear and chipping that you'll find on this particular model. So in the tool that I work with called DDo, which is part of Photoshop, which is what you see up here, one of the things that I've done is I've built what's called a smart material, which is essentially a... <laughs> I don't normally explain this the way I'm trying to think of it. It's a collection of layers, for those of you who are familiar with Photoshop, which pretty much does the exact same thing to any number of models. So, for example, I've, I've created a set of scratches, dirt, uh, imperfections, and other, other assorted wear and tear on one model. I want to carry that forward to the rest of the models that I work on. Um, the, in the kind of work that we do, there's really no sense in reinventing the wheel. So what I do, essentially, is I find one look, I'm happy with that look, I move that look on to the next model and replicate that as best I can. The, the smart material function in DDo allows me to make one model look pretty much exactly the same as another model, provided that they were modeled similarly and they were built similarly. If they were vastly different, say you have a tank versus like a, an entire space station, you obviously have to tackle those things a little bit differently. But for prop between prop or door between door, you can usually get a pretty close approximation of the, of the look, regardless of um, you know what tool you use. So if I, I've already applied my uh, smart material to this, so you'll see in the viewer, once I export it out, you'll see there's already a, a subtle but significant change on this particular model. There's a lot of edge highlighting now, which is kind of, it's not metallic, so it kind of breaks up the edges and makes them look a little bit less shiny. And from a distance, it makes them pop out a little bit more. There's also a lot of imperfections and scratches that are popping up now and that are a bit more visible than they were before. This is something that we are very keen on on pushing as hard as we can. We want these, these models, even though they're in a pixelated art style, we want them to look very beaten and worn and damaged. We want you to feel like this, even if you're looking at it through uh, a hardware interface, which is in your brain, we want you to feel like it's a real place. And accordingly, it's going to have damage. None of this stuff's going to look perfect. Uh, um, you have a few questions if you um, yeah. are interested. Um, by all means, you guys are welcome to ask anything. Um, these two are from Darth uh, Jamex. Um, first okay. is, does it have collision detection when partially opened? So, and uh, can I get to that one first and then move to the next one? Yeah. Okay, so that's going to be more of a Chris question, but judging from my knowledge of Unreal, uh, I don't think that would be a problem, but the door would need to open up completely before we would, I think we would allow the player to move through it. Otherwise, it may present issues, uh, unforeseen issues that I wouldn't even be able to like, speculate on right now. But ideally, what would end up happening is you go and press a button, and then the entire animation plays, and then you're able to walk through the door, and then when you leave the door, it senses that you've left the proximity of the door and it closes behind itself. Which is pretty much how it, it should function like that, it shouldn't be a problem. We could look into uh, scripting in malfunctions or other unique properties to these particular doors that can make them kind of, I don't know, maybe they'd open up a little bit and they get stuck and then they close back up, or they would open up a little bit, get stuck, and then fully open themselves if you were to perhaps wedge your pipe in there to force it open. Um, but other than that, I mean, generally, it would be a scripted sequence where you were to press a button, and that button would tell the engine to force the door to animate and open up. So for the uh, the other question, um, what would that one be? Um. It's also, okay, uh, it sounds like everyone on the team is using different tools for similar tasks. Does that cause conflicts or issues? No, not really. Uh, because we're all artists and we're all trained in very similar uh, mindsets and, and whatnot, uh, different tools actually, in some ways, can help you look at the same task in, in a way where you would, you would realize that there's, what's that old phrase, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Um, you can, obviously, you can, you can get efficiency from doing everything in the same particular manner. But in the case of what we're doing here, I think uh, part of the strength of the team is that we all work in, in very unique ways. And in the end, um, all of the props, for example, that you've been seeing have been done by me lately, except for a couple of them, but most of them have been me. And I'll actually show them to you guys here in a minute as soon as I'm done working on this. But I think as a team, like 
you hear the word diversity a lot, but it also applies to how people think. And the diverse nature in which we work and think and exist with one another in our, in our uh, remote work situation has actually, in many ways, been really beneficial to us as a team. Uh, I've been opened up to new ways of, of working that I hadn't th thought of before. And I've, honestly, I've, I've been, I found my, my workflow improving, having been challenged by other users in our, in our team with different software sets and different skill sets to not only improve myself, but to learn more about what I already do. So uh, if anything, it's, it's been, I don't think it's been a problem at all. It's been really helpful for us. So um, are there any more questions or? I'll read them to you as they come. Okay, cool. So uh, you guys can see I'm kind of working in Photoshop right now. What I want to do is I want to get these particular details in. Now, I'm a real stickler for trying to, to stick to everything that Rob puts in his images. If he puts it in there, I assume that it's in there for a good reason. So I'm going to actually trace over this particular detail, this uh, piece of paint here that you see. And I'm going to get this approximated about as close as I can to what he's got there with the black trim and everything else included. And then I'm going to put that inside of this particular model and I'll export that to Marmoset Toolbag, which is my previewer. And you guys will actually be able to see it in action. So, ideally, um... <laughs> what is that sound? I'm not used to that. <laughs> it's creepy. Oh, it's the hosting sound. <laughs> <laughs> Just random sound. Well, it's the sound. It's the sound for um, events that happen, like um, uh, following, subscribing, hosting. Oh, okay. That's just weird. It feels like something's creeping up behind me. <laughs> okay, so for you guys who are watching, what I'm currently doing right now is I'm I'm actually adding anchor points to a vector path, and I know this tool well enough to know exactly where I need to place these points to get the the roundness that I need. And I'm going to actually to, to speed up time or speed up on, because we're only going to be here for about an hour. I don't want to take too much of your time. Um, but to, to get this to where I want it to be, what I'm going to end up doing is a couple of little tricks to get this particular vector into my other project really quickly so you can actually see it on the model. So I'm going to take that, come over to the, what's this is called an albedo map. So this is going to be the um, in the particular workflow that we're working with, I, I'm sorry if I'm a little scatterbrained sounding, but in what we're working with is called physically based rendering. And in this particular form of rendering, for which is a lot of modern game engines, including Unreal Use, uh, PBR allows you to get a close approximation, not perfect, but close of how actual light works and, and functions with models. So with the Albedo map here, the reflectance of the metal is driven by what you're seeing in this image. So if I was to come in here and I made a layer that was, I don't know, let's say it's like bright blue, for example, or, or red even. So I come in here and I paint directly on my model and turn this red. What you'll see is a red reflectance on that particular piece inside of uh, Unreal and inside of Marmoset. So it actually changes the highlights that are being reflected back at you. And it does it in a way that is still metal. So in this particular workflow, the color that you see in this albedo map is going to determine what you see as a, what they call a specular reflectance for the, uh, the metalness. So to get that particular look of the, the arrow in here, what I need to do is I actually need to make a, uh, a paint layer. So I've got that here and that paint layer actually has to be created a very specific way uh, I can't actually do this without changing the metallic property of this particular uh, texture. <laughs> so if you look at this map right here, this is called the metalness map. And the metalness map is what drives what you're seeing here. So if I re-export, we can get rid of this red stuff that you just saw on the screen. There we go. So now you see the, uh, the piece that I just modeled, or sorry, <laughs> vectored. I have a lot of different terms I have to keep straight in my head when I talk. It's so much easier when I don't have to say anything about what I do. <laughs> uh, but that's you said, get to work in silence. Oh yeah, I, I sit here and listen to music all the time. Um, but the ideal solution, what I'm going to do, is this is going to be yellow with a, a black outline. And I also don't want this to be metal. I want this to be what they call dielectric, which is essentially in texturing terms, it's not metallic. 
I want this to reflect light as though it's a plastic decal and not as a piece of uh, stainless steel. So to get that, I need to actually tell or instruct Photoshop or paint or whatever you want to call it. I need to actually force it to recognize that as not being metal, which again, everything in this, in this particular image, the metalness map is determining what is and what is not metal. And what is white is metal and what is not is, is not metal. So what you see here as being black is, as I said, not metal, and what, what's white is metal, and everything that's in between is varying degrees of metalness based on the opacity of what's above it. So what you're seeing here is dirt. So this is dirt collecting in cavities of the model. Uh, if, this does, like, if this doesn't make any sense to you, think of this model as having been cut like a fish, laid down on a, on a cutting board, and then put into a 2D image that you're painting on top of. And then that gets magically reconstructed and put back onto the model. <laughs> It's such a weird concept to, to explain, but that's how it works and pretty much how every game works. Um, you, you lay out what's called a, uh, a UV unwrap. And in fact, I actually didn't grab the UVs for this, so let me go ahead and put them in there and I'll show you what they look like in uh, 2D terms. One second. Oh, and for those of you guys who are interested, this is actually being uh, textured in 1024 resolution, so 1024 pixels by 1024. And if we go back to the Albedo map, you can see my UV map. So this UV map is what's determining how you see everything, essentially. So like this particular ring right here is a flattened version of the center ring, this part right here in the, in the middle. And because it's flat and straight like this, what I'll be able to do is create a caution tape and then detail it seamlessly all the way along without having to worry about it bending or stretching. It's not gonna look weird or, or jiggly or anything. It'll make more sense when I wanna put it on there in a second. But first I wanna go ahead and get that, that rectangle in that I was talking about. So let me change these UVs so that they're screened, which makes the black go away. And then set the opacity down to 25%, which is the keyboard command for me. And then change the rectangle itself so that it starts off being that yellow color from Rob's concept. And again, because he put it in there, I'm assuming it's for a good reason. Um, you probably can't see the color picker because this is all based on the window, and it's only going to broadcast the window for Photoshop itself and not the color picker. So currently the color is an orange, right? It's a kind of a deep orange, but it's a very bright orange. So for it to display correctly, it needs to be closer to a... Where it was 85% bright, it needs to be closer to 60%, because otherwise if it's too bright in PBR, it will reflect too much light, Therefore, it breaks the laws of physics and just kind of becomes a really bright blob. Um, let me actually show you what that looks like. It's kind of funny. So, um, with the color of that rectangle, apparently it's... Hold on a second. Okay, it's RGB, so I didn't actually grab the right color. One second. There we go. Now I've got the, the color that I want. It needs a black outline, which is done by coming up to the very top here and then giving both of these a stroke of black. But I don't want it to be pure black. I want it to be kind of a dark gray, like a 10% gray. And then I don't want it to be too thick. Oops. There we go. That's pretty close to what Rob has. Now what we can do is export this out with the UVs turned off because otherwise you'll see the actually you know I should show you that with the UVs turned on because then you'll actually see what the UV map looks like on the actual texture map or on the, uh, the model itself and it will maybe help you visualize what I'm talking about it all sounds like crazy talk if you don't do this work so <laughs> don't worry if I if I sound a little weird it all has its place and meaning but you see how the the UVs actually lay out on here so you can see there's a very, actually, let's make it even brighter. So it's very unmistakably on there instead of being kind of ghosted and, and uh, You have a question. Did you eyeball that or line it up? Uh, that was eyeballed. Um, I could have actually lined it up because I did trace over Rob's image. So if you want to see how accurate I got this thing, I'll show you. So copy that, bring it in here, and then turn this into a, what's called a smart object, which is Photoshop's way of instancing 2D data. Okay, so this is kind of being overlaid on it right now. And it's kind of snapping, so it's a little little off, but not by much. Like I'd say that's within tolerance. So I'm happy with it. If Rob doesn't like it, I'm sure he'll tell me, but 
we have a pretty good rapport. I, I do what Rob says, and Rob's happy. So that's that's <laughs> pretty easy communication. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I have yet to see him be unhappy about something. Usually, if he's, it's usually just like smileys and hearts with everything I, I show off. So uh, I'm not happy with that. Uh, the guy's kind of like an idol to me. I don't tell him I said that, but <laughs> it's. Oh, I'll tell him. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> it, it is quite amazing working with someone who really kind of influenced your your position uh, where you are. Like, the easier way of saying it is like I don't think I would have been an artist if I hadn't played System Shock. Like this game influenced me to be who I am now and where I'm at so it's to work with the man who set the creative vision of the original game now is like it's mind-blowing it's it's hard to really put into words what it's like to, to do this and to actually put his vision into reality it's it's very it's very honoring you know it's like the, I feel like it's a privilege and I try to make sure that he's happy because again you don't want your essentially your art director to be unhappy with the work you're making so <clears throat> oh, um, real fast. Yeah. Is there a way you can turn your mic up a little bit? Uh, that's a good question. Let me uh, check my... If possible. It says you're... They're saying you're a little bit low, but it could be the distance between your mouth and the mic. It's like right underneath my mouth, so it should be okay, but... Yeah. Here. I mean, who knows? Is that any better? Let's see. <laughs> Tell us if it's any better. Hopefully it's better. I keep forgetting people can see what I'm doing. I think I got louder, not you. <laughs> That's weird because I haven't actually touched the settings. Uh, let me huh. go to my audio devices and just double check and make sure that it's at full strength. It should be, but who knows. Yeah. I love it. I have mic, but I must scream. <laughs> I definitely don't want to scream. My son's trying to sleep. Um, oh, shh. No, he's in, he's, he's in the other room. We'll be fine. We're totally fine. <laughs> Uh, let me just double check the, the settings one more time and then we'll keep going. Cool. Uh, where are we at here? They're saying to check your broadcaster too, but I think that's all the way up. Yeah, everything is totally up. I don't know what the problem could be. Hmm. All right. Well, sorry about that, guys. So, in the meantime, what's going on here is you can clearly see that this looks more like it's stenciled or kind of like watercolored onto the metal rather than being its own material. Uh, paint put on metal is not going to just appropriate the reflective qualities of metal unless you have uh, like a, a gloss coat. And even then the gloss coat will still have a bit of its own reflectance to it. So to get that particular effect and make this thing pop out and look like it's supposed to look, what I need to do is put this into the correct position on the, uh, and by correct position, what I mean to actually say is I need to make this dielectric. I need to force that particular detail, the painted detail that I added, to be a, a dielectric material instead of a mater uh, metallic material. So let me name this layer real quick, because I don't want to be that guy that someone points out later on and says, hey, how come you don't name your layers? I normally do. You're not that slick. <laughs> um, let's see here. So we'll just call it sticker, and I'll stick this into the roughness channel first off because this needs to have its own uh, reflective quality now i didn't touch on roughness but in the terms of uh, the work that we're doing roughness is what defines the reflective quality of the metal so the shinier it is the darker it's going to appear in photoshop so what's pure black or a very dark gray like this particular scratch and chip is going to be very shiny and what's very light and not shiny well, yeah, I mean, what's white is not shiny. So, as you see on the map here, this particular area, if you look at it in Marmoset, you'll see, like, these areas are here not very reflective. So, this is what kind of drives the interest of the material. It allows it to look like it's supposed to, while still kind of... kind of talking myself into a corner here. It looks cool. That's what it does. It, roughness allows the material to look cool and look accurate to what it's supposed to be. So... That being said, this to approximate what a sticker would look like on a metal surface is more likely going to be kind of, it's going to be offset. It's not going to be the same reflectance of the, as the metal in most cases. So to get that particular look and feel, I need to rasterize this layer so that the 2D pixels that I put in here are turned away from being vector data and turned into actual pixel data. So that allows me to change the levels and change the brightness and everything else associated with this. So what I want to do is I want to actually clamp the levels down and 
with what I'm doing, what it, what it really means is I'm kind of bringing the whites and the darks closer together so that this pops out a little bit more and it doesn't look like it's so... You'll see. One second. Now this also needs to be put into the metalness channel too, because if I don't put it in metalness, it's not going to make any real big difference in the way this thing looks. So this is not metal and I don't want it to be metal, so I'm putting it in the metalness as a black layer. So I'm going to change the value of this so that it becomes pure black, which is done with a... You can't see what I'm doing, unfortunately, but we'll work on that for the next stream. But now this is completely and totally black, so when I go to export this, which is what I'm doing right now, you will then see... Um, I have a question from Darth Jamix. Sure. Uh, will the arrows rotate automatically with the animation, or is there something else required? So, because this is attached to the model, and because it's part of it, it when it rotates, it's going to rotate the whole thing. See? Pretty cool, huh? So, the... If this was, uh, like, if the stickers were actually, um, like, a, what we would call a decal, where there's, like, a transparency driving the look of it, where it kind of, like, slaps onto the side of it, then we would have to find a way to link that. But because I'm doing this inside of the actual uh, texture itself for the particular model, it does look like it's... It's part of it. So it's it's literally no different than taking... Well, let's rephrase. Not literally, because literally being no different would mean that... Wow. <laughs> word choice, word choice. It's really no different in practical terms from putting a sticker on the door if it existed in real life. If the, the piece moves, that moves with it. So that's pretty much how it works. So honestly, the vast majority of this thing is already done. Um, I can probably push it a little bit more. Um, one of the things I want to do is make the scratches and the details pop out a bit more, and that's going to be done using another tool that we have in our particular, or in my particular library, which is called Endu, and that's Quixel's normal map offering tool. Now for those of you guys who don't know, normal maps are pretty much what drives a lot, and I'm not kidding, a lot, if not almost all, of what you see in modern games. Normal maps are essentially what, what com it compensates for shading, and it's a kind of a mathematical formula that makes models look like they're incredibly detailed when they're really not. So this model was modeled in what's, you know, it's a high poly model that's been baked down to what's called a low poly model. The high poly model has tons of detail. You're seeing the results of the bake process here. If I turn off the normal map, you'll see how just undetailed this thing really is. It's kind of just a shell. It, it really just carries the normal map data. When I turn it back on, you can see there's so much that's being driven by that normal map. And without it, it's really not a whole lot, right? So the uh, a big part of this is making sure that the normals look right and making sure that everything is you know baked down and correct. And when I say baked down, I mean transferring the detail from the high poly model that I made down to the low poly model, which I made. And then making sure all the UVs and everything else is, is accurate. It's, it's kind of like balancing... Uh, a bunch of eggs that are going to break at any point in time, and if one of them falls, it ruins the whole thing. So that's another thing to kind of be aware of when, when working on this kind of stuff. But I feel like I'm rambling, so forgive me. What I want to do now is add the lights to this. So I'm going to actually add uh, green lights because this thing's going to eventually open, and I'd rather have the green rather than red. So what I'm going to do is add that as a particular material that we can then export as an emissive map. Uh, and emissive maps in games uh, are part of the texturing workflow, and that's what emits light. So when you see uh, in Chris's workflows, or sorry, streams, or in the screenshots that we've shown where something has light coming out of it, and it's part of like a model in the, in the world, that's an emissive map driving that. So what we have here is the emissive map, which I just created. And forgive my copy of uh, Photoshop kind of going crazy. Ever since I updated the, the creator's update number two on Windows 10, uh, the <laughs> every time I maximize a window, it has a, like a 10% chance of the top of the window just disappearing. If somebody knows a fix to that, I'd really love huh. to hear it. It's driving me nuts. Um, so right now this emissive map kind of has, well, dirt shouldn't emit light, right? So we're going to fix that by making the background black. And that's not black, but this is. There we go. So that's going to be the, uh, the background for this particular map. Now I need to go back to the Albedo map, and I need to actually add the material to it that we're going to be using. So give me one second, and I'll get it set up. 
Actually, where the... Something disappeared on me here, and I can't seem to find it. Give me one second. Sorry about that, guys. Either I just went blind, one of the two. <laughs> it happens sometimes. Okay, there we go. So... Also, real fast, I think you may need to turn me down a little bit, because I know I'm really loud. Uh, well, you're not really talking that much, but I went ahead and reduced the desktop volume yeah. a little bit. Alright, so I'm adding the um, material for the lights now. Now, I'm, I'm in, kind of imagining that this is going to be a plastic piece, so that's what I'm going to go ahead and add. Again, I, for those of you who just popped in, I'm sorry you can't see the screen that has all of the materials that I'm working with on it. But trust me, that's what I'm working with. I'm, I'm grabbing stuff and showing it. Next time we do the stream, I will live demo another piece. And I think you guys will hopefully be able to see more of what I'm doing on my screen. Um, for some reason, OBS has problems with hardware acceleration. And the tools that I work with are extremely accelerated. They have to be to do what we're doing. So they just show up as black windows on the screen, no matter what. So the, uh, the what do you call it? The, the light material is called plastic scratched, right? I have a mask pre-built for this. Apparently I didn't actually add it, so I need to open up the mask. Again, you can't see the open window either because of the way this thing's set up, but I'll have it open in just one moment. So here's the what we call an ID map, and every color on this map is going to determine where these materials actually go. So everything red, I have already predetermined to be steel, and everything that's black is nothing, and everything that's green is going to be plastic. So I'm going to turn this into a mask, which everything that's going to be white is going to shine through, and everything that's black is not. So I'm going to actually enter the mask for this right now, so I can actually kind of transfer that detail over. And then make sure this is black first, because I don't want the majority of this thing to be plastic. I only want a couple small bits of it to be paste in that particular piece that I just uh, copied over. And it's in there. Now, of course, it's not blue, right? So we need to change that. So the color needs to be green, which actually, if we want to be super accurate, let's go ahead and sample that from Rob's concept. So this particular shade of green will be perfect. And that is hex value 6FF2E. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know, hex values are driven or drive a lot of these color choices. So it's just an easy thing to paste in Photoshop. There we go. Now we have that as a light. Now in the emissive, I also need to change that too. Actually, I may change it back in the albedo. It's probably too bright, but. Um, I have some questions for you. Yeah, what's up? So are emissive maps not impacted by other lighting sources? So if you had completed darkness in the emissive maps, would the would still show full bright? Um, I'm trying to think of. So I'm actually have to read that one. It didn't really. Um... Okay, so emissive maps not. It's from Pappy Biscuits. Okay, so the emissive maps, yeah, they actually emit light. So think of emissive light light sources as an actual light bulb in the world. So, for example, uh, in Unreal, you can use emissive maps as light casting actors. And what that essentially means is, if I was to make this centerpiece here just a giant light bulb, essentially by making all of this uh, shine white or green or blue, in the engine you could make it so that this actually does have that particular light casting effect and what it would do when you go to bake the light maps that, that you would see that coming out of here it would look like a what, what's the best way to put it you know and like if you've seen the matrix revolutions when neo is like getting and spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't seen it but it's been like 10 years uh when neo is being like uh plugged into the matrix and like you see the light come out of his mouth that would be what it's like you would actually see it kind of look like that um but that we're not going to go that crazy here. We just need these. Um, <laughs> we just need these pieces right here to, to light up. So let me go ahead and put this over here and export. There we go. So to make it show up in the tool bag, what I need to do is number one, I want to make the background a little bit darker so it pops out a bit more. So we're going to change the backdrop brightness, and you can see that this now has a plastic effect. You can see the reflectance is a bit different than the metal behind it, which is good, which is what we want. But we also need to add the uh, emissive map, so I need to tell it to do that. So under here I'll add emissive. I don't know if you can see that part of your screen, but it should be there. And then emissive. Now you can see that the light is actually casting, as it should be, and I can make that as bright or as dark as I want. 
Now what's really cool about uh, Toolbag is I can actually use this to emulate what it's going to look like in Unreal. So if I go to my camera and I change it so we have a little bit of uh, what you would call bloom. Uh, for those of you who play Fortnite, it's not the same thing. Uh, Fortnite bloom has something to do with where you shoot and the bullets go random directions. And this bloom is what we normally refer to as uh, light beyond 1.0 blowing out and making it look like a glow around the, uh, the light source. So to enable that, I just need to come in here, hit broom lightness. Oh, wow, that's crazy. Gross, right? We don't want that. But we do want this to pop out. This is going to be close to what it will look like in game. Not that fuzzy. So let's just bring that down a little bit. Maybe bring the size of it down. Whoa, that's super bright. I'm sorry, guys. Let's turn that down. There we go. So that's kind of a taste of what it's going to look like in engine. Um, if you haven't noticed yet, a lot of the videos show some really cool fog effects. Um, you, the, the, the blurriness of the screen is actually going to be slightly approximate to that. So you kind of have an idea of what it's going to look like. And with the animation, there you go. Now you can actually enter through the door. Pretty cool, huh? So this thing is mostly done, other than, uh, like I said before, with normal maps, I need to make the scratches pop out. And that's kind of where I rambled and forgot what I was talking about normal maps about. So <laughs> here we go. Uh, I'll actually show you what I'm going to do here. I need to take, and th this, this is the uh, normal map right here. I'm pointing at my third screen, but it's here for you anyway. <laughs> You can see the scratches from the material, the, the steel that I made, are actually in here, and they're overlaying on this. Uh, keep in mind, everything you're seeing here is a visual representation of uh, mathematical data. So the math in here is telling you that you can kind of see the slope of the, the main shape, right? But what it's doing is it's compensating for the shading of the, the low-poly models. So you'll see, like, you can see the triangles here coming from here to here, where it's kind of... There's a different color here, and there's a different color there. It's just instructing the engine to, or in this case, tool bag, to render that so it looks exactly like the high poly model. Which is, it, it's quite fascinating. I'm not entirely sure how it all works. And honestly, I don't really need to know because it's not my job. But it is something, if you're ever interested in learning about, check it out on Wikipedia. Just look up normal maps. It's a rabbit hole you'll spend a good chunk of your night looking up <laughs> just to, to really understand what it's all about. Um, but for what we want to do... I want to take the uh, some of the scratch layers that we've got in the uh, weathering and make them pop out. So if we look at the what is it downward wear and tear, whoops, this stuff right here. I want all of this to pop out, and I want this to accentuate the the fact that this door has been used, this door has been abused, and this wor this door exists in this fictional world of our space station. The uh, the place, I, I guess, where I'm going to be dead soon. I just came to realize that. I, I forgot that because I'm part of this crew, I'm now going to die. That's something to look forward to, I suppose. <laughs> oh, that's right. You're going to die too, Carly. We're all going to be dead. Yeah. So, you know. Or maybe we'll be cyborgs. That'd be pretty cool, too. That would be cool. I like to think. I would like my own special room. I like to think that perhaps I got sucked out through the, uh, the flight day because I'm one of the flight day guys. And maybe I'm just kind of following along with the, the Gamma Groove execs that kind of jettisoned before they had a chance to get killed by Shodan. Which, as you guys who've played System Shock already know, was kind of a futile gesture because she turned the life support off before they jettisoned, so they're kind of screwed either way. Anyway, back to the point. I want to take this mask that I have here, and I want to turn this into a bit of additional detail. Now, you can't see what I'm doing. Um, you can see what I'm pasting it in here, but it's not the same thing as actually seeing what I'm working with. I'm sorry. Just pretend that you can see it. What I'm doing right now is I'm setting up our tool called Endo to process that black and white image into a scratch map that is going to enhance the depth and enhance the material that already exists. So what I'm doing right now, you'll probably see Photoshop blank out and come back a couple of times. You can actually see the, the scratches here. They look awful. Don't worry, I'm going to fix that. Now I'm going to indent them and make them pop out just a little bit more. And then set up the overlay so that they actually blend with the background normals. I'm going to have to play with it a little bit to see what they look like, but you can already see that they're tearing up the perfectly smooth bevels of the normal map that I baked, which is great. That's exactly what I want. And when we go in here to inspect it up close, you'll see what I'm talking about. Yeah not terribly noticeable, 
you have to kind of look for the spot where it's at because the scratches weren't terribly deep. I can make it pop out even more if, if need be. I may actually even do that just to give it some more character. Any Anybody who does this stuff will probably agree that it's sometimes better to go overboard than it is to make it so it's invisible. There we go. Let's try that. Although that may look like a gouge. I don't know if we would want that or not. Let's see. It should be on it. Where did it go? How's the chat going, by the way? Oh. Good. They love your door. Oh, and I see Deep Crew is here. By the way, thank you so much for the awesome avatar. It is like one of the best portraits I've ever gotten. So, she does amazing work. I'm, I'm always impressed with the, the work she does for us. So, um, yeah, let me just double check. Yeah, okay, so you can see where the scratches are kind of popping out now. There's only so much you can do with this resolution, unfortunately. Um, yeah, there's a chip right there, too. Uh, if this was like a... I would natively work in the 4,000 pixels. Um, you would see tons of stuff on this door, but because everything in this particular game has to have the same pixel resolution, I need to be able to take any of my props, any of the wall pieces Chris has made, any of the mutants and cyborgs and anything else that we're working on, they all have to look like they belong in the same environment. So no one pixel can be any larger than the rest. So that pixel right there is the same size as everything else. Uh, we have what's called a pixel standard of 256 pixels per meter. So for a two meter object, you have 512 pixels. For a four meter object, you have 1,024 and so forth. This is a two meter object. Uh, the what do you call it? Um, the map for this is 1,024 pixels, only because of the sheer scale of this thing. Um, like this piece right here is 512. The inside of this is like 256. Uh, when you put it all together and work with it, it all kind of comes together like it should. So it ends up working okay. Actually, I just realized one thing I could do uh, before we move on and show you some of the props that I've done in, uh, in recent history. This actually needs to be scratched up because according to Rob's awesome concept art, you can see that it is all torn apart. And I didn't really accurately reflect that. So let's get that in there too. Now we can actually do that, if I'm not mistaken, by coming into the roughness map for the metal that I've built. And take that and use it as a scratch map to then wear off that particular paint. And what I'm actually going to do too is I'm going to make the, the stickers pop out just a little bit so that when I tear them out, they look like they have depth rather than just being kind of scratched off. So, let's see here. Um, I'll take this steel layer and make a copy of it. And solo it by itself, rasterize it. If what I'm saying doesn't make any sense, don't worry. It will all come together in just a moment. So I'm going to clamp this so that this is... Um, yeah. The chat's saying, I thought Chris was using a 512 standard. Uh, it should be... It may have been for one of the the, uh, the wall pieces he was working on, which is why this door was set up to be 512 pixels. But because mm. of the sheer sale, uh, scale of this thing, it needed to be 1024 to maintain the 512 pixels. Otherwise, it would be too. It would be. It wouldn't match. Long long story short. Cool. So yeah, it's we're definitely uh, it, it's all consistent. It has to be. Otherwise, it, it it's out of place. And if it's not consistent, it just means I have to do twice as much work by going back to fix it. And I like to work smart, not hard. So I prefer to keep <laughs> everything as unreworked as possible because the more time I spend reworking, the less time I have to get this game done for you guys. And me too, I want to play it just as much as you guys do. Maybe not as much, but some of you guys have been waiting for this for a very long time. And trust me, we're doing our best to get it out to you as fast as we can. So for the sticker, I'm going to add a mask to it. You can't see me adding the mask, don't worry, but it's, it's getting there. There's the... Okay, that's weird. I thought I'd copied it. Hold on. I'm making a fool of myself here on live stream. <laughs> What's the stream if you don't have a, a little bit of fun at your expense, right? Yeah. Alright. Let me try this again. Rasterize. Delete layer mask. Clamp it one more time. Almost there. Okay, that's good enough as a reference point. Okay, I'm just going to hide it this time and not delete it so I don't have to... That is so weird. It's actually not pasting what I'm what I'm giving it. Which means I'm screwing something up. Oh, I know what's going on. Dirt. <laughs> 
So Photoshop has what's called a layer style, and DDU works like this particular map you're seeing in the background. This is done through a layer style called a pattern overlay. I rasterize the layer. I didn't rasterize, uh, rasterize the layer style. That's what I forgot to do. Now it's clamping correctly. Golly. That's what it's supposed to look like. I knew someone was off. Stum on me sometimes. Okay, so for this I want to now invert that. Or actually I don't have to invert it. Let me do that in a minute. Add the mask. Try again. Boom. There we go. Haha. <laughs> so now you can see the it's really gotten torn off, right? Like you can barely see it there. We may have to go back and fix that. But for right now, just for the sake of showing it off, I'll I'll just leave it there the way it is. So for the this piece here, come in. Paste. Yeah, you can. You're chopped off. Oh yeah. On camera. Oh. <laughs> Better. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sometimes I want to like get up close to my screen, and I just happen to be too far away when I sit like that. I, my my webcam is nice, but it only has a limited field of view. All right. Now I need to paste this on the sticker. Actually, I did it on that one. I need to do it for the metal on this one too. We're almost there. Sorry about the weight, guys. Yeah, streaming is definitely not easy. No, and it's it's something I haven't done in a while. I've done live streams for Quixel, but it's been like over a year since I did one last. So it would be so much easier if we had one streaming computer and we were all in one office. Yeah, it would definitely help. So here's what the damaged version. This is gonna look like hell in a second. Oh yeah, that got torn apart. That's a little too much. I can already hear Rob's voice in my head telling me to turn tone this back quite a bit. But that is actually, you know, the process to get it to look the way I want it to. I've already given it the, the mask it needs. Now it looks like it's been sitting there for about 50 years and someone's been beating up on it with a, uh, a Dremel tool. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll, we'll just leave it for now. Um, you guys have basically seen what this thing looks like from start to finish. It's almost done. I, I'm going to do some additional work to it after I get off the stream. But I will show you guys now, since we're kind of running out of time, and I've been talking nonstop, the, uh, some of the other assets and stuff that we've made that I think you guys will really enjoy. So let me go ahead and load this up. Um, let's see. I've been working on the medical labs, or level rather, nonstop for the past month and a half. So one of the recent things that I did you, that actually didn't get shown in the last update was the uh, medical carts. And you'll see what I mean by pixel uh, size and resolution and whatnot. You'll notice that even though this Syrian shear that I made is you know, one of the first props that I made, all the pixels are still the same size as this cart, even given their relative uh, disparity in size. Uh, and this actually matches Rob's concept almost perfectly. I'm like, I'm really happy with how this one turned out. Um, there's two different versions of this. There's one that's a uh, cold storage, and there's one that's for medical tools and supplies. Um, some of the props are comically large, but then again, Citadel Station itself is kind of weird to begin with, so it's okay to have some of these, you know, syringes look like they're going to murder you. So, <laughs> um, yeah, and it is kind of a short stream. Um, I'm, I like to talk about a lot of stuff and, and get it over quick. I hate the sound of my own voice, so I don't like to talk and, and subject you guys to the horrors of listening to me forever. <laughs> but, You're fine. Yeah, this is actually built to have the doors open. In this particular case, the way I set it up, it, it can't, but if I just zoom in here, you'll see that you can go inside them. Oh boy, look at that. Isn't that cool? So, uh, ideally, what would end up happening is you press the buttons on here, they turn green, uh, they slide open, you may find some medical patches. Or if you've read the Hacker's Guide to Sin, there's lots of drugs in there. So, you know, totally read that. It's awesome. It's on TTLG. And speaking of TTLG, you guys at systemshock.org, I'm pretty sure you're listening to this. So, hi. How you doing? Um, yeah, so this is the medical cart. Again, cold storage, uh, regular storage. It gets wheeled around. you got little stoppers you can stomp on to make them stop moving. Not too much different from the actual carts that you'd see today. Um... Let's see what else do I have that you guys might be interested in. Some of the other stuff I've shown off in the past that were in some of the updates. Oh, that looks awful, doesn't it? Well, let's repath those. Actually, yeah, let's repath those textures. So these look weird because I have uh, changed the uh, location of some of the textures that they were assigned to. So they're loading up something else entirely currently. Ah, there we go. 
let's just do that. So you'll see that we have a can of Traptimum brand soda. I don't believe in calling things pop. I'm from Florida, where we Great call pop. things, you know, soda. Uh, if you who calls it pop? Uh, you know, if you go to pop versus soda dot com, you'll see that's mostly a northern thing. Uh, but oddly enough, there's people in the south that call everything Coke, which. Huh. Even though well, yeah. it is not all Coke. How the hell do you, pardon? How do you um, order a, a Sprite when you call it a Coke? That doesn't make any sense. Um, I'll have a Coke Coke, a Sprite Coke, a Pepsi Coke. Yeah. Right? So, uh, unfortunately, you can't get medical waste pop, so this bag is going to remain sealed. This was fun to make, too. I actually did all the the wrinkling and endo, and I've got it set up so that you can wrinkle it in a ton of different ways. Um, that's a nasty little budger. I wouldn't want to open that. I don't even know what's in there. Um, one of the recent things that I worked on was the nurse computer the Trioptimum brand cup that you may actually be able to purchase at some point, fingers crossed, and the personal display device, not to be confused with Star Trek The Next Generation's personal digital assistant, otherwise known as a pad. Personal access display device? I guess what it was called? Yeah. This is totally a pad, though. Come on. Come on. Like, I can see like Picard holding this thing in his hand. Um, oh, man. I've got this thing set up to rotate, so potentially you could even like just press E and have it spin around in circles if you wanted to. Um, I really like how this one came out. You can see the normal depth I was talking about, where there's been scratches gouged into the uh, screen. Um, I actually even used Endu to get the screen to look round. It's very much flat, it just doesn't look like it because of the magic of normal maps. Um, again, this is all high poly modeled and baked, so everything you're seeing here is coming through the illusion of depth, which it really doesn't have because it's a very basic model. A couple of other models we've done, or I've done rather, one of my favorites is the uh, pedestal. I love this thing. You guys probably saw this in the, uh, the June update, or was it May? Did the update for the current month or the previous month? That's... We've done it for this month. Uh, it okay. was on the 8th. Cool. That's what I thought. I'm just double checking. This has got to be arguably one of my most favorite props that I've done so far. And this is, again, a high poly model of bake uh, down to a low poly. So it looks way more detailed than it really is, but that's kind of the magic of the work that we do. Um, if, uh, what's that thing from Futurama, like when Bender encounters God, and it's like, if you've done your job right, nobody will know that you've done it at all. So oh, yes. uh, this is actually set up so that it can operate and animate too. Ignore the fact that it just popped through itself. It's not really designed to do that. I'm just, you know, setting it up the way it might look in game. So you can actually, ideally you would kind of walk over to this thing and then take a seat and sit down and do your work. I don't know how you would work with this thing. All I know is that Rob said make it, so I made it. But this is the pedestal that you may have busted up a few times through your lead pipe that's directly underneath the power station where the crate with the grenades are in the area where you wake up, the, the cryonics area. Or not cryonics, healing suite area, rather. I got System Shock 2 mixed up in my head. So yeah, again, this is one of my favorite props. I just love the way this thing came out. It's like almost spot on to Rob's concept. So like, I know he was super happy to see that too. Um, we have a sanitation dispenser. This one's kind of, well, textures are screwed up on this one too. Let me fix that. Oh, I know why it's screwing up. Because it's using a quick save normal map. Hold on. There we go, fix it. I do that a lot, I'll throw a uh, quick save texture. I just press F4 in Photoshop and it spits out the same map to the same file so I can see it update in real time. Uh, this is what you pretty much walk up to and you press this button and then you get hand sanitizer. You can wash your hands off, come over to the, Sweet. the blow dryer, blow your hands off, and then go back to work. Because you're in a medical facility, you need to keep your hands washed at all times, even if there's mutants and cyborgs around. Uh, let's see. You guys have probably already seen the syringe. Uh, I won't show that off because I actually don't have it ready. One thing we didn't show was the test tubes. You may have recalled seeing these in the original. They did not look very good. Uh, original game had very limited support for transparency and alpha maps in general. So there was no ability whatsoever to really make them look like anything other than blotchy, noisy pixels. This is also noisy because of the nature of the scale. Like, it's getting so small 
that the pixels are almost bigger than the object in some cases, <laughs> as you can see here. But it's my job to work around those limitations and try my best to, to make it look like it's supposed to. And this is another Rob concept turn 3D. Uh, when you see the concept for this, you'll see that this is pretty much identical to what Rob wants. Um, it's a point of pride for me to make sure that he's happy every single time because this is the guy that makes System Shock what it is. Um, and if you didn't know, he was the guy that made the look of Bioshock too. So if you're really a big fan of Bioshock's uh, aesthetics, and you should be because it's just, Jesus, it's amazing. Um, he is the guy that made the look of everything in that game. Like he set the mood and the feel for it. Um, if you check out, I think it's robwatersart.com, you can see all the sketches and, and work that he's done for everything, including the original games. And it's just crazy. Like, he's so talented. It's. <laughs> I need to shut up. I'm just spawning now. <laughs> So uh, another thing that I worked on too, um, and you can see, like here's one of Chris's wall pieces. It's very basic. It doesn't have any of the lights or anything else that it would have in Unreal. Uh, I just put it in there for comparison to make sure that the, the pixel scale is all the same. So if I was to take all these pieces and shove them up to this, oops, I'm missing a couple of components. One second. It's been a while since I've opened the scene, so I forgot which pieces are individual components and which ones are not. There you go. So you can see, like, the pixels are all the same scale. They're all the same size. They all look exactly the same. Uh, obvious differences being the materials, but um, here's your bloody surgical equipment. Um, this thing is strong enough to cut through bone. Um, assuming somebody has had this used on them to graft parts and other pieces onto them unwillingly. Although I think the... What are those things called? The restoration bays are used for that, for cyborg conversion. So I guess I don't really need to do it by hand. It's not like it's... They, they've evolved past that, I suppose. You've got your uh, Trioptimum brand bloody surgical tray. If you're wondering why there's more blood on the bottom rather than the top, it's been sitting in a pool of blood. <laughs> That's all. Good, good. Uh, let's see, what else do we have that I can show off to you guys? Oh, I actually had the syringe ready. I just put it in the wrong area. It was the syringe up close. This is also one of my favorite pieces. Uh, this was a lot of fun to work on. We're going to make the center of this thing transparent, and it's going to look like it's got fluid in it. Um, I would like it if we made it so that you could stab people with it, but I don't think that's going to happen. So don't get your hopes up there. Uh, let's see, anything else I can show? Um, I can show you the, ooh, uh, the maintenance door. Uh, this is going to probably look a little different in-game. You guys remember, or may remember this as that evil-looking door that you see coming out of Pipe World on the medical level. This is also a bit animated, but really it's not much to write home about. It's a very simple animation. Um, this was fun to make. The, the high-poly model for this was such a pain in the butt. Uh, in 3D modeling, what you can do oftentimes is symmetrically model. So you can see that this component is basically one giant symmetrical piece other than the windows and this lip at the bottom, or teeth, whatever you want to call them. But I made this thing go crazy with depth. Like, I wanted to make this thing look like you've been tearing it apart, like someone took a chainsaw to it. Not that you would do much to metal, but the paint, it just looks like it's been ripped apart, and I love it. It looks so cool. I know I'm tooting my own horn, but I think I have the... <laughs> I'm gonna do that. <laughs> but I, I think it turned out pretty good, so... I really wanted this thing to look like it's real, as real as it can be within this, you know, frankly, I wouldn't call it cartoony, but it's definitely not a realistic game. It's got elements of realism to it, but it's obviously not real, because, you know, nothing pixelated can really look terribly real. But it does have its charm, and it, I think it's, I think it fits into the aesthetic really well. And we even use the same font, Stop Standard, which is, I think it's from 1975? Really old font. Um... What else have I done that you guys would probably find cool? Oh, the microscope, the thing that started it all. The first task that I had. You probably saw this in the first update. Um, there's two versions of this that I've completely forgotten about, and I've played the game probably 50 or 60 times since I was a kid. Uh, there's a green version of this, and then there's a red version, so we'll have to make sure that we, uh, we adjust this so that the, the red eyepieces are actually uh, green as well. And that's, that's all customizable, so we can change the, the keys and whatnot to be different colors. Uh, it doesn't really matter. We can make it brighter or darker. And you can even zoom in and put your eyes in there. Ooh. Uh, I think in game two, if anybody is asking, I haven't checked the uh, chat yet, 
uh, there may be the possibility of some stuff animating on these screens, uh, but as you can see, there's only a few pixels to really work with. Honestly, I think there's more pixels in this screen than there were on some of the props in the original game, so that's already a huge improvement. Um, so we'll see if we can have something pop up on it, to kind of give it some more immersion. Um, let's see. I did work on the initial keypad, but this has already been changed, so this is kind of probably not going to be used. But the, the version that we're going with now has buttons, so you can actually press them and you can see the keypad light up. Um, this at one point did say 451, uh, it does not now, don't worry about that. The version Chris made is way better than this, uh, this one was just a quick mock-up. Uh, running out of time here, I'm almost done, don't worry. Oh, you know what? I know what I can show you. That. That's a cool piece. If you guys remember, uh, Citadel has this uh, weird thing where they like to, the guys that try after them have like these uh, logos on each floor that tell you what specific areas are, not that it wouldn't be obvious because you're on the medical deck, you would think you would be on there and you wouldn't need a sign telling you that. But this is the medical slash uh, Citadel logo. And on the back of this is fluorescent, uh, fluorescent tubing, I just kind of mouth that wrong. Uh, this is also, if you looked in the Unity demo, the original version of this was actually not as accurate to Rod's concepts as this is. This is spot on. Like He actually had the tubes behind it rather than the edges. So this is what is going to be the standard frame for all of the different details like the armory, uh, radiation hazards, actually if we end up using it for that, uh, science, maintenance, which I can't wait to work on. That was so creepy. Um, pretty much all the decks are going to have their own individual unique logos and whatnot. And yes, I did model the uh, the tube lights. Uh, you know, it, there's a chance you'll see it because before I deleted that piece in the back, that was going to be the, the just kind of a, an example of how it would attach to a wall. And you would actually be able to walk up and look at this thing. And I wanted you to be able to see the lights because it was kind of goofy to just have it floating there, you know. Um, so yeah, you can actually see behind it to a certain extent. Like this is about as far as you'd probably be able to see. Uh, so realistically, you'd be like this looking up. So you probably wouldn't get to look at it like this unless you were able to rest it off the wall. I don't think we're going to allow people to do that. Uh, you probably won't be able to shoot it off the wall either. So, um, yeah, and the, the light tubes are emissive too, so in the engine it will actually cast light very much like this. This is making use of uh, Marmoset tool bags, or what do you call it, uh, global illumination. If I turn that off, you'll, you'll see that it's kind of not as cool looking. I also have a light in the back there that's also influencing. I turn the, I think I had the GI on? No, it's off. With the GI on, it's nowhere near as powerful, so I had to put an extra light back there to make it pop. But you can see how the, the relationship between emissive lights and actual lights affects the way the world looks. So if I like crank this up to 900 instead of 10, you see that it really kind of pops out. But it also makes the front pop out too, so that's kind of why I left it at a low level. Didn't want it to be too overpowering. So I had to kind of boost it with a... It's one of those video game hacks that we do as artists to, to make things pop out and, and work, even though they physically wouldn't work the way they are. Because you would use a different light bulb for the inside of this and a different light bulb for that. They wouldn't be controlled by the same like switch or the same intensity. Uh, you wouldn't have like one bulb controlling the other, which is what's happening here. As I change this, the front gets brighter and darker. So, um, yeah. Uh, if you guys got any other questions, feel free to let me know. Um, Otherwise, I'm going to be back later this month. I should have some more props to show you guys. I bust through these things about one every day to every other day. Uh, the nice thing is, I think I'm allowed to say it, is that the prop list for the medical deck is getting a lot smaller, so you guys are going to probably start seeing other stuff really soon, which is one of the reasons why you're seeing the Iris door, uh, which I'm still super happy with how that turned out. Uh, that was my favorite door in the game, and it was so cool to actually get to work on it. Um, I've got some other stuff that you guys can see too coming up soon, but I'll put it back on the iris door just so you guys can see. I think that's going to be such a cool looking door when you're able to run through it in the game. Especially oh, yeah. just animating it. it, it's so cool, like really understanding how these things function to make them work the way they're supposed to. So, um, You have a few questions in chat. Sure. Um, is there any props coming up soon that you're really looking forward to modeling? Uh, let's see. Um, I know it's going to sound weird, but, and this isn't really a prop so much as it is an environment piece, but those tiles on the 
maintenance deck. The brown tiles, they're all over four. I love those things. I actually started working on them. I'll show you guys a mock-up of it. It's probably going to change, so don't get your heart set on having them look exactly like this. But this is a super, super basic rendition. I'll show you the high poly of it so you can actually see the um, what they really look like. Um, if anybody recalls, this is pretty much what they look like. Uh, I'm going to try to model them so that you can actually potentially have these panels like missing so there's kind of a uniqueness to them. Because you can see that they're actually handles that you can lift up because you would ideally be able to like pull them up and expose like cables and, and framework and other stuff that you need to do work on in the station. Because it seems like um, the way they've set up Citadel is that maintenance is where all the critical stuff kind of flows to. So they should be able to just pull up a floor tile and work on, uh, I don't know, some, something goes wrong on the, on the holodeck up in level six and they're like okay well this wire goes up there we're going to just kind of play with that and splice it back together by pulling up this specific uh, floor tile so maybe again this is just me talking i i have no authority on how things are going to go but maybe uh, the way i was seeing it is that some of these tiles are going to be missing and you actually see work had been done prior to everything kind of going to hell uh so you might see tools and stuff laying around the maintenance deck in addition to whatever mutants happen to be there waiting to kill you um, so that's, this is something I really like. It's such a basic design, but it, 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 along with the other tile sets from the original game, is what makes this game look so unique and what really cements it in the minds of like players, to me. And, you know, it's just fun to work on some of this stuff, too. And actually, I can show you something else, too. This is going to be the last thing I show, unless there's any other questions. This is a scene that I mo uh, kind of whipped up real quick using Megascan's assets from Quixel, which is, again, the, uh, one of the companies that I work for. It's actually my main job. I, this is uh, the work I'm doing for Night Dive is a second job. I just. Oh, you got all robotic. Yes. Hold on. There we go. Is that any better? Yes. Okay. That is because uh, enabling global illumination. Even though I have a 1080 Ti in this computer, uh, GI in Marmoset Toolbag is incredibly expensive to run in real time. And with all these plants and everything else in here, all the transparency, it runs terribly. So the robot sound is my computer trying to process my voice and process the video simultaneously, and it doesn't do a very good job of either. So, as you guys can see, um, this is a Megascan's ground texture that's been basically system shocked to uh, you know, be kind of pixelated and, and shock looking for the, the art style what we do. And the plants the 3D plants that we have have actually had their textures downscaled and their resolution set to look exactly like what we want for our uh, art style. So they look pixelated and blocky when you get up close to them as well, including the alpha maps too, which you can see on some of these tall grasses, because they're still blocky and, and Minecrafty, and system shocky, whatever you want to call it. So um, yeah, at some point, uh, Megascan's assets are going to be a huge... Uh, addition to the the grove areas when we kind of we're kind of building ourselves up we're down here we need to get up here um, i just wanted to do a test with it to see how this stuff would look uh, i think you guys are going to be in for a real visual treat when we get there it's going to be so cool like the groves are one of my favorite areas in the original game even though you're only there for a short amount of time and i can't wait to make that look the way it was supposed to in 1994 but engine limitations and, and computer limitations in general just couldn't allow it um, with that said, unless you guys got any other questions, I need to get going, uh, but I will definitely be back. Yeah, let's wrap it up. Uh, it's It'll be really, really awesome to be able to hang out with you guys and show you that, uh, you know, what we're doing and, and the importance of all of it, because, again, we're doing this for you guys. I mean, the Kickstarter was a huge success, and we want to make sure that you guys are all taken care of and that this game is the best it can possibly be, and that's why I'm here. I 100%, like, looking straight at you here. I'm a guy that grew up playing this game. I believe in this game. I'm going to make this game come out, come hell or high water. So don't worry, guys. <laughs> we, we got this. We got this going. It's perfect. So. Yeah, you'll be back June 28th, same time as today. Um, we have plenty more streams coming up this month as well. So yeah. follow us on Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Discord, all of that. I may have to swing in and, and harass Steve when he's on uh, stream oh, yeah. these days. Maybe I'll just play Fortnite and have, it, have it blast through. Yeah, you can join chat while Steve streams tomorrow or any other Friday. Yeah, I might. I might him. It just depends. Like, I don't want you guys to listen to my son. 
uh, he's a great little kid, but he can be very, uh, very much a handful. I don't want him to like get upset on. I mean, the that's children. <laughs> yeah, he's a great little kid, so it's just you know I prefer it to be adult interactions for the most part. So I try to avoid this kind of stuff unless I can have a quiet house in the meantime. But yeah, I definitely yeah. will be back. Um, so it, like it's an honor to work with you guys, or rather work for you guys. Uh, we'll be back. Uh, see you guys soon. Bye.